Yat in, good afternoon. Welcome to Seahouse an Hour, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's a beautiful Friday afternoon, um, and uh, we have uh, quite a special guest with us today. Um, our guest is my aunt, uh, Zani Gorman. Um, our, my uh, grandmother, Sylvia um, Gorman Grant, um, her brother was Carl Gorman, and uh, that is Zani's uh, father. And so Zani is my aunt, and um, he was one of the original um, code talkers. And so today, um, as we uh, celebrate Veterans Day, uh, we wanted to just have a little uh, discussion about about our Navajo code talkers, code talkers, excuse me, and you know the significant role they played in in um, defending our country and ultimately um, kind of um, bringing us to uh, to success in in World War II. Now, uh, you know, before we get to our topic here. Um, I'd like I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Mahayo Maynes. I'm the public relations director with Yehal Nido, the Navajo and Hopi Families COVID-19 Relief Fund. And um uh Cherokee um, originally from Chinle, Arizona. Uh, we did have Seahouse an hour this week on Wednesday. Uh, we had a great discussion with a couple of ladies who um, had uh, participated in a, a, moto, a moto endurance race. And so today, you know, uh, on Veterans Day, uh, we wanted to uh, talk about, uh, you know, to highlight the service of our Navajo Code Talkers. And that's why we have um, Zani here with us today. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let uh, my aunt Zani introduce herself and uh, we can get started from there. So thank you. And Auntie, go ahead. Thank you, Mahayo. It's great to be here with you today. Um, happy Veterans Day um, to you and to all those that are listening. Uh, and those of you that are on that served, thank you for your service. Uh Zani Gorman Nishia, Bilagana Nishna, Do de Bethlehem Bashishin, Ado Bilagana Dashiche A Kiaani Dashinale. I currently live in Gallup, New Mexico. Uh, I'm a graduate student at the University of New Mexico in, in Albuquerque. Uh, travel back and forth like a lot of people do. <laughs> and uh, I, I finally got to the point where I'm working on my dissertation. I'm in the history department. I'm about halfway through it. Uh, it's a process. <laughs> it's taken longer than, than I expected it to take. Uh, but you know, I'm plugging on. So uh, it's it's great to be here with you, Mahayo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Auntie. And uh, oh, you know, I, uh, excuse me for uh, for um, not mentioning, but my, my aunt is a historian, and you know the 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 bulk of the focus of her work has been on the original um, twenty nine co talkers, as her father was one of the the co talkers. Now, um, I did also want to um, <clears throat> just uh, thank all of our um, our servicemen in all. Um, in all branches of the of the military for their service, um, we have uh, as Native Americans, I think per capita, we have the the highest amount of um, of of Native Americans who are of people who serve in the army, and uh, I think that it's been like that, you know, throughout history. Uh, my dad uh, served in the in the U.S. Army, and uh, my uncles did as well, and so. Uh, I think a lot of people can identify with um, having veterans <clears throat> in their uh, families, and that's one thing that I think is um, is kind of uh, we can relate to across the board as as Native Americans. Is we know someone who who participated in the army. Um, for for many of us, we hear uh, these stories of uh, of our veterans coming home, and. Um, and they don't want to talk about their service, you know. There's some of them, um, they come back and um, and they just kind of want to forget about it and and live their lives, kind of move move forward. Um, my my dad, he would talk to us about about his service, and uh, you know, he kind of told us um, some of the things that he had to um, 
do, you know, some of the hardships and, and some of the, some of the positive things. Uh, so uh, it's always nice when uh, we hear the, those, those insights into the history of our, of our relatives and our people. And uh, so I wanted to ask um, Zani, uh, you know, growing up as the, as the daughter of a Navajo code talker, um, did, did, did grandpa just openly share his stories of being of his service and being a code talker with you? Um, uh, yes and no. Uh, you know, you're right. You know, a lot of particularly men and women who, who served in the military and especially those who who saw combat um, are, are usually the ones that um, are least likely to share stories only because, you know, they, 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 they're carrying a lot of uh, pain and suffering and uh, memories that, that, you know, they, they don't want to talk about. And traditionally, uh, veterans usually don't talk about, you know, they say, you know, you don't share those kinds of stories, especially with, with children um, or even women, I've heard say, but especially with children. Uh, and, and traditionally, you know, veterans, when they came home from battle, warriors, when they came home from battle would have um, the enemy way ceremony to cleanse themselves of of all of that, you know, psychologically and emotionally, physically, and and then once you have that ceremony, you put it all behind you. Uh, you don't you don't talk about it, and yet you know it's 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 interesting because the Navajo code talkers they've been placed in a position where they they have to you know talk about it right. Um, it, they, they at the time didn't know they were going to become this kind of national icon, right, that they've developed into, um, you know, they were just doing their duty as Marines. And, and yet their story has become so popular in American narrative. And uh, they're always constantly have been asked to, you know, come forward and, and talk about those experiences, right? Yeah. So I, I often um, think about that, you know, when I I, I lecture, I do a lot of lecturing across the country. I've lectured up in Canada. Um, and, and I think about the fact that traditionally these men don't initially do that. Um, with my father, you know, growing up uh, to kind of <laughs> give away my age here, uh, the code was declassified in 1968. And in 1969 was their first honors. And in fact, this medal behind me um, is the first medal that was ever given, uh, was given by the 4th Marine Division Association at their 22nd annual reunion in 1969. And it was given to 4th Marine Division Native Americans. It wasn't just code talkers that were recognized at this thing, but the code talkers were also recognized. And then there was one person from each of the other five divisions that was chosen. I don't know how they chose the person, but they did. And it just so happened that my father was chosen to represent the second Marine division. And so he was um, awarded one of these medals. So this is the other side has an image of the fourth Marine division, a symbol. So I didn't go to this event. Um, I was in 1969. Let's see, let me do my math really quick. <laughs> I would have been about um, six years old, maybe. Uh -huh. um, so so when when the men came back from that event, then in 1971, it kind of inspired them to have a reunion. Mm. And I put reunion in quotation marks because of the 400 some odd code talkers that served, they they were not a unit, right? They were scattered throughout all six divisions of the Marine Corps, and at and they were um, strategically placed at every level of communication. So you found them obviously in combat on the ground. Uh, you found them with reconnaissance teams. You found them on shipboard helping with uh, uh, the radio nets that they would use to coordinate like landings. So they used the code talkers at every level of communication, you know, very high levels down to right, you know, right down on the, the combat level. Um, so these all these men all didn't know each other at the time, right? <laughs> some of them knew each other. Some of them, you know, maybe have went to the same high schools together, went to, you know, Tuba City or Shiprock or Wingate, you know, so some of them didn't know each other. But for the most part, many of them did not. And so this reunion that they had was to start bringing the code talkers together. 
From that, they formed an association in 1972. Uh, and my father was one of the first, um, uh, what do you call them, um, board members um, that, that are officers that was uh, elected at the time in 1972. We were living in California at the time. He was working as a, as a professor at UC Davis. Um, he was one of the first four founding faculty members of the Native American Studies Department there. Um, but basically the early 70s is when I started to get introduced as a child to the Code Talkers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my I, I'm from my dad's second marriage and I'm the baby of the family. Um, and I was, my, my dad was pushing 60 when he had me. So I was a late baby <laughs> and oftentimes, you know, late babies are kind of like only children. <laughs> you know, we, we, we don't have a whole lot of, uh, uh, brothers and sisters around a lot. So, so mm -hmm. anyway, as only children, you get dragged to everything your parents go to. And, and so I got dragged to, you know, code talker meetings and I got dragged to parades that they were, um, marching in and and oftentimes uh, the younger set you know as kids we would get volunteered to carry the, the banner um in oh, front yeah. of the, the marching group so that yeah. was my early um my early experience with the code talkers and you know I had no idea who these guys were uh -huh. um and my dad you know my dad was active in the association um he didn't like sit me down and you know tell me the story or anything like that it was just kind of the slow Mm -hmm. dawning realization of who they were sitting there you know as an only child you do a lot of listening to adults <laughs> so mm -hmm. I kind of picked up bits and pieces of things as I was younger uh and that that was kind of my introduction to to the men and what they did oh wow that's awesome I mean uh that's really um <clears throat> it's really um it's neat to hear uh about how um how young you were when you were you know, um, starting to participate in maybe some of the events or tag along to the events that that uh, Grandpa had um, had went to. You know, because you know when we think about Navajo Nation parades or any kinds of veteran celebrations, uh, we I feel like as Navajos we automatically associate those things with uh, Navajo Code Talkers and their participation. We always I always you know remember seeing them in all of the parades that I had went to when I was younger, uh, walking in the parades. Um, nowadays, you know, um, we'll, we'll, we're lucky if we're, if we're able to see them. And, and I really feel, you know, I really feel honored any, any and every time that, uh, that I start to, that I see Navajo Code Talkers. Um, you know, when, <clears throat> as you're starting to, you know, as, as a young child and, and maybe even, you know, kind of fast forwarding a few years or so, um hearing hearing uh, grandpa's uh, stories <clears throat> partic going and participating in some of these events that he's going to as well you know um when, when did when did like the significance of the service start to kind of you know make an impact on you and even um as you as maybe as you kind of move forward in terms of of pursuing uh, uh history and becoming a historian um you know when yeah when did that kind of click with you that that you know wow i have a very great resource here you know a lot of these co-talkers are, are still alive you know at the time and i really need to start to maybe document or hear what it is you know that they have to say in terms of their stories yeah yeah so like i said it was kind of this slow dawning uh, awareness of who these guys were and um, probably, <clears throat> oh, I don't know. I, I think it wasn't really until I was in my late teens, early twenties, um, that, that kind of all this culmination of, you know, history that I've been hearing and hanging out with the guys and with their families and, you know, the early Navajo Code Talker, um, association meetings were very different. Uh, the men would come together and <laughs> they were very, you know, follow Robert's rules of order. They were very straightforward and get everything done, you know, very efficiently. Mm -hmm. And and it, they'd have their meetings done in, you know, a couple of hours. And, mm -hmm. and then um, and then the, the families, all the the wives and the children would be there and, and we'd have these huge potlucks. Uh, and and so I really missed those days um, in the early years of the Code Talkers Association. 
But um, so one of the things that kind of struck me at some point, and I really can't tell you when it was, it was probably in my teens. Uh, every once in a while in the association meetings, the guys would start talking about, you know, their history <laughs> as, as how they, you know, got started and, you know, memories would come up and the guys would start talking about different things. Um, and it, it, they would always start talking about, uh, you know, how the program started. And, and some of the men were, were very adamant that Philip Johnston started the program. Philip Johnston, Philip Johnston, Philip Johnston. And Philip Johnston, by the way, is the Bill of Ghana who is credited with, you know, um, bringing the idea to the Marine Corps. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so he does get a lot of credit um, in popular narrative. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the men who were first 29, the original code talkers, and then some of the other men that obviously knew about them, you know, would would say no you know it was these guys these guys started it and so there was a little bit of you know contention <laughs> there mm -hmm. in the in the ranks themselves about who the first 29 were because as a historian mm -hmm. i've i've come to think that i i think philip johnston didn't really share the fact that there was this first group of men that they were the pilot group that was recruited specifically to create the code to create a code and test it and see if it was even going to be viable to do and, and think about it, you know, if, if they had not produced a code that was viable, the Marine Corps would have scrapped the idea and moved on, right? I mean, they were in the middle of a war. Mm -hmm. So what this group did was very vital in, in getting that program started. And so that kind of always stuck in my brain. It's like, well, who were these first group? You know, who were these men? What did my dad do? And so then it wasn't until I was in my... Oh, mid twenties when I finally went back to to school to finish my bachelor's. I went to the University of Arizona. Uh, I had I was a single parent. I had three young boys: my oldest, Michael, and my twins, Christopher and Anthony. Uh, the twins were about three when I started school, and it was at that time um, I was actually studying education. I was going to be a teacher. And after I had my twins, I thought, no, I don't know if I can handle kids 24 seven. So I was, I was going to finish my degree in education when I went down to U of A. And it was one of those strange things that just happened. And I didn't get into the program and didn't meet up with the right people. I mean, it was just kind of crazy. And so I turned to my, my, my real love, which was history. And I thought, yeah, so I just went down to the history department and got accepted and, um, at that point, I started to do some serious research. Uh, it just so happened that right before I went to U of A, this man had, well, this woman had called my mom out of the blue. And she said that her husband had been a Marine recruiter, and he thinks that he had recruited my dad into the Marine Corps. And yeah. he had heard that my father was going to be lecturing down in Sedona. This was back in the mid 80s. So. Yeah. Um, but she didn't want my mom to tell my dad, uh, she wanted, they were going to show up and have a, you know, be a surprise. So anyway, yeah. I was moving to Tucson. I didn't go to this event. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But then several weeks later, my mom and I were talking on the phone and she was telling me about this meeting. And, uh, sure enough, it appeared that this guy had recruited that original group. Now, mm -hmm. later in my research, I've discovered that there were actually two recruiting units that came in in April of 1942 to recruit that that group so he, there were other marines that were also recruiting at the same time as this one guy oh wow um but you know that that's kind of what triggered my oh <laughs> my wow. fascination and oh I'm in school and I'm in the history department and I'm going to study this <laughs> so I I started to talk to my dad um asked him you know do you remember these guys uh, are you in touch with any of them? And he had kept in touch with a couple of them, you know, John Brown Jr. from Crystal, um, uh, Dean, Dean Wilson, uh, mm -hmm. Judge Dean Wilson, a couple of them he had kept in touch with, but the rest of them he hadn't. So I started to try to find these guys. Anyway, mm -hmm. long and short of it is I, I found about, I think, seven or eight of them, including my dad, and I interviewed them. Um, those interviews are all re uh, recorded um, and and um, archived down at the University of Arizona. Wow. Uh, I think they now have just recently digitized them. 
So oh. you, I think you could get, find them online. Um, mm. But anyway, so that's what started me off <laughs> looking uh -huh. at, uh, seriously looking at, at the first 29 and their story. And I've just been doing it ever since. When you started to uh, interact with and reach out to these, uh, you know, originals, uh, not original, but the seven or eight that you were saying that you had found and um, ask them <clears throat> to interview them, were they all pretty open and uh, oh yeah. They, they 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 wanted to to tell their stories yeah um yeah they they were very um open to me uh and excited to you know reconnect with my dad and and to tell their story basically um i remember for example chester nez who's become kind of famous as that group because he was the last surviving code talker and he had the biography written about him uh code talker um so he's become quite popular um but he, I, I was actually the first person that ever interviewed him. Uh, I found him living in Albuquerque with his son, and he, he, he was ready, you know, re willing, very readily willing to talk about it. But and I recorded them on on those uh, the reel to reels, the Nagra reel to reels. Oh wow! And so when I recorded him, his son set in on the in on the interview. He asked if he could do that, and I said, Yeah, sure. And after the interview, um, his son, he told me, he said, you know, he says, I'm so, he says, I never heard my dad talk about this stuff. Wow. And he was just really blown away. And his, and Chester had um, suffered PTSD as many, you know, many veterans do, mm -hmm. combat veterans. Um, and so he had come back and he, you know, drank for a while and he would have nightmares. Um, and he was very descriptive about these nightmares that he had. Wow. Um, and, and I was really surprised not to hear it, but, but that he opened up so freely with, with me mm -hmm. and some of them did, you know, they, they told, you know, those sides of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, my father, on the other hand, you know, growing up all my life, you know, he had his stories, right. Mm -hmm. But they were always the funny stories, you know, the big bullfrogs in the, in the, in the foxholes that would jump in the foxholes and scare the hell out of them, you know, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he he never talked about you know the bad stuff mm -hmm. and it wasn't really until the end of his life um and i can touch share that later um you know that that a couple of things came out um oh, wow. that, that i had never my mom and i had never heard him talk about before wow. but going back to these men that i interviewed you know they they all were very very um uh willing to share their stories mm -hmm. That's uh, that's that's incredible, especially uh, being the first person to uh, to have interviewed Chester Nez. Um, you know, when you think about those things, it, it must be exciting in some ways to kind of, you know, to know that you were, you know, you documented a, a certain aspect of history that nobody had been able to access before then. I think that that's awesome. You know, congratulations in doing that, especially in any of your work. Um, oh, yeah, um, in in because it you know it contributes to the larger scope of how we were able to view uh, the history of our people. Um, and a lot of times, you know, our people only open up to to other Navajo people. You know, they want to they want to you know, if they're going to open up, they want to talk to other Navajos. You know, was there any uh, were there any issues with um, like translation where when you did the interviews, they all the co-talkers talked in Navajo. They didn't uh, or talked in English. They didn't they didn't prefer to, you know, talk in Navajo or you didn't have to have a translation. Um, you know, it was a little of both. Well, you know, first of all, they, they they were bilingual, right, because obviously they had to be to be co-talkers. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they knew that I was not a, a full um, speaker. Um, so they would talk and I would try to get them to talk in Navajo. I did eventually, um, have a woman that, that helped me out because yeah. I wanted initially when I started my project, I was going to do a documentary mm -hmm. and I was involved with these people from Tucson and to make a long story short, um, I don't think they ever really understood the story and, and, as I was doing my research, we initially were going to do a, a short 30 minute documentary and I kept finding more and more great information and they had very stereotypical 
ideas about what it should be like and mm -hmm. you know it was it was kind of a bad situation mm -hmm. um but in that video what i wanted to do was i did i wanted to you know have them um tell stories in navajo i wanted to gear it toward um you know navajo youth mm -hmm. and have them talk to youth and so i i asked them specific questions that i wanted them to answer in navajo mm -hmm. but um and i did both those real to real interviews initially and then i we went and we did video interviews and unfortunately those video interviews may be lost forever i have what are called um, window dubs where they have the the running numbers on the bottom that you can't use professionally oh. um, i have those and they will be archived at some point Wow. But the company that I worked with, um, they never, they, you know, it was quote unquote their material. And so oh, they never wow. gave it to me. Wow. Um, and I'm in sure. fact, there's a couple of those interviews that I don't have. I, I was not given copies of them in window dubs, unfortunately. Yeah, that's really unfortunate. But uh, the window dubs sound interesting as well. You know, I guess uh, if you can't use it professionally, it definitely seems like it's something that would be. Uh, nice or interesting to see yeah you can watch um, them and i can at least quote from them right <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so uh you know uh according to your research and also um uh, according to um you know maybe some of the stories that you heard i kind of wanted to just maybe put a little bit of a uh, of uh, context towards the the time period uh, of of when our, our Navajo code talkers were being enlisted or drafted into World War II, you know what has what had Grandpa told you about that? What are some of the what are some of the stories that you've heard in your interviews? You know, was does it seem to be like there's some similarity in terms of of how uh, our our Navajo uh, people, Marines, code talkers, kind of got enlisted or were drafted into World War II? Yeah, well, it was a little of both. Um, some of the men enlisted and some of them were drafted. Um, the original group, the original group were all volunteers. Uh, they, they all stepped forward and volunteered. As I said earlier, there were two uh, recruiters that came in. Uh, one was from the San Francisco uh, Western Recruiting Division. And then the second group was uh, the Regional Recruiting Division out of Phoenix. And they both came to the reservation uh, the one out of Phoenix, the man, his name was Major Frank Shannon, uh, recruited um, specifically in the boarding schools. And oh, wow. interestingly, I did research on him. He in his he was in World War One, and then in the interwar years, he actually served as a as a he was a Bureau of Indian Affairs employee. Uh, he was a school teacher. He was a school administrator. He worked at Albuquerque Indian School, Phoenix Indian School, and one of the Apache reservations um, on the Arizona side. I don't remember which one it was now. Um, but he he had experience with the boarding schools. And so I think that's why he targeted them. So he went to Fort Wingate, Shiprock, and Tuba City and directly recruited boys out of those schools. And actually a couple of teachers. For example, John Benali, who was one of the original 29, he was actually a teacher at Tuba City um, when he was recruited. Wow. And um, so they were all volunteers. The, 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 that first group, um, about a little, actually a little less than half of them were out of the boarding schools. The other group that was recruited were, were they targeted men who were working uh, in older and so like my father, you know, my father was working as an interpreter for, for the federal government up around um, Kayenta, um, Navajo Mountain area uh, mm -hmm. under the stock reduction. And um, when, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, uh, a lot of Navajos were laid off their work, off jobs. So my dad was unemployed at that time. And so they heard about the recruitment and they went into Fort Defiance, and that's where the actually the headquarters of Wind of Navajo Nation was in Fort Defiance mm -hmm. uh, before it was in in Windrock, and so this was kind of right around that transition period. So uh, that uh, that first group, the average age was about twenty three, and when you look at all the code talkers, four hundred of them, the average age is about nineteen. So uh, you know it was a, it was a broad spe spectrum. 
uh, men that were working, men that were married, men that were unmarried, um, young kids, uh, like mm -hmm. Dean Wilson, for example, was just shy of 16. <laughs> he oh, lied wow. about his age to get in. Um, <laughs> now, there were several of them that did. My dad mm -hmm. lied in the other direction. He thought he was too old. He was 35, and he actually lowered his age by 10 years um, <laughs> on his discharge paper. So, wow. you know, there's there's all of these great stories about, about how they they ended up there. After the first group, uh, they came back and they started to recruit more and more, but then they also enlisted the draft. Um, the United States started to use the draft. And so there are code talkers um, that were drafted. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is, um, as early as 1943, the Marine Corps started to realize that it was getting difficult <laughs> to find Navajos that were bilingual that could do this program. And because of the draft, when the draft went into place, you know, the Navajos were being pulled into other branches of the service. So there's actually um, documentation showing that the Marine Corps talked to uh, and made agreements with other branches of the service that Navajos that were going into these other branches uh, and if they met these certain qualifications were rerouted and placed in the Marine Corps. So for example, I remember one code talker, I think it was Roy Hawthorne, um, his story. I can't remember exactly, but I'm pretty sure it was Roy. I remember he, he I heard him say one time that he wanted to be in the Navy. You know, he had seen a, a when he was in school, he'd seen a book um, and it had pictures of boats on the ocean <laughs> and he oh, really wow. wanted to, to, to do that. And he said, you know, so I, I, I enlisted to go into the Navy and he said, next thing I know, I was in the Marine Corps. He says, I have no idea how I ended up there, <laughs> Wow! <laughs> but that's how it was. They, they were rerouting men into the Marine Corps. So, yeah. So some of them, you know, enlisted and volunteered and others were actually drafted. Dang, that's interesting uh, in terms of uh, how they um, were recruiting, you know, at boarding schools uh, and also uh, kind of the age range targeting people, you know, maybe around uh, 19 to 23, people who were um, bilingual as well, too. Uh, I think that that's that's fascinating. Also, the the circumstance of somebody wanting to go into the Navy, but then ending up in the Marines is is kind of like, wow, you know, what they, did, they didn't sign up for this, you know, in a literal <laughs> sense. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, like the, I guess during those times and, you know, because of the urgency of this of the the situation, you know, you kind of went where they where they placed you. Um, yeah. you, you you talked about this a little bit, you know, just in terms of um, how early on, you know, you were going to the meetings of the organizations, the co-talkers uh, uh, organizations. But uh, um, what what have you been told about after they had enlisted? Uh, I mean, they they were they were drafted specifically to be co-talkers, or they they were they enlisted and then. You know, there was an urgency for them to to become code talkers. You know, is uh, how did that kind of happen? For, and then for the original, the the first twenty nine to kind of come together. You know, what what was what are some uh, circumstances around that formation? Well, uh, you know, the first twenty nine were were brought together. Obviously, from you know, they were pulled from boarding schools. Uh, they were pulled from jobs. Um, or like my dad, unemployed at the, at the moment. Uh, and, and so they were a group of men that, that for the most part, probably didn't know each other when they first met. Um, and they were placed in their own platoon when they got to boot camp. Mm -hmm. They were platoon 382. And they were, on, they were the first all Indian, all Navajo platoon in the history of the Marine Corps, but they were only one of two all Navajo platoons or all Indian platoons ever in the Marine Corps. So what happened is um, after the first 29, uh, there was a, a smaller group that was that was recruited. And I think they kind of sat, sat around and waited. <laughs> they mm -hmm. went through boot camp, but then they kind of sat around and waited until more men came in. And the, the Marine Corps thought, I, you know, there's there's a saying in the Marine Corps, there's the right way, the wrong way, and the Marine Corps way. Mm -hmm. And um 
the military was getting a lot of pressure from the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, to, to have these all Indian platoons. Mm -hmm. And their reasoning was that we felt more comfortable <laughs> being together and um, that we kind of needed to be coddled. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there was these big, and so the army had a lot of all Indian platoons. The Marine Corps, like I said, said, this isn't practicable. <laughs> We're not going to do this. We're going to do it the Marine Corps way. We need these men out there. So what they did after the second all Navajo platoon, which was, I think, 52 or 53 men, which was platoon 297 in 1943, men that's, that came in after that, they just started to you know, you came in, you automatically were assigned into a boot camp platoon to get through boot camp. And then once you got out of boot camp, you were then transferred over into communications training where they had already established the, the Navajo Communications School. And so that's where you would go and learn the code. So wow. um, I don't know if I am answering the question or whether I kind of yeah. went off left field there, but <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that that's that's kind of the process of how how they came into the service. Oh, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, that sounds uh, that sounds like what you had said. You know, uh, sorry if I'm if I'm reiterating here, uh, but uh, you know, um, I think that uh, we kind of touched on this too. But this was before we we got on live. You know, we hear we hear stories about uh, the translation of the code. Uh, you know, how words have come about and what their meanings were, uh, you know, um, things like so for uh, battleship or for um, submarine, um, you know, what, what are some, um, what are some things that you have learned about, you know, how the code was derived? And uh, I, I do have screen sharing capabilities if you were, if you were wanting to share anything. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, we were talking about that before we went on, um, and I will share something here in just a minute, but I want to preface it. So, sure. you know, as I said earlier, the Navajo Code Talker story has become kind of this uh, this this popular narrative, right? You can go almost anywhere in the United States now, and oh, Navajo Code Talkers, right? So everybody's kind of heard about them, whether it's through books or documentaries or movies. Mm -hmm. um, but there's this popular narrative, and 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 when stories become that big in in American history they kind of get whitewashed <laughs> mm -hmm. they, you know you kind of lose the detailing of, of the story yeah and unfortunately that that's happened and for various reasons um one of the areas that this is very very obvious is with the code the way the code is described mm -hmm. you know for and I think part of it is also because you know there's 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 these stereotypical images right about us as indigenous people and one of them is that you know that we're primitive right we we come from primitive cultures we come from simple backgrounds we you know we're part of nature so there's all of these kinds of stereotypes and you see this play out um historically in the way in which in early when 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 the army and then later anthropologists started to come out and study us right when they were first looking at Indian languages they couldn't make sense of them and and so they just they passed them off as simple languages you know primitive languages that didn't have the capability of expressing things and so this idea of simplicity in in, in indigenous languages for me carries over into how people unconsciously think about the Navajo code it was a simple it was a simple code because it was made from a simple language is kind of the basis of i think how people think about it so when you read books about the code talkers that are out there now they explain the code in two ways they'll say the navajo code talkers substituted words for words they didn't have in their language hmm. and they developed a coded alphabet and that's usually as far as they go well, yes, they, they coded an alphabet and they use substitution, but what I want to do and what I'm, I'm working on in my dissertation or beginning to play with is this idea that these, I want to change the way people think about it. I want them to think about it in terms of techniques, methods of coding. So when you're asked to put a code together, you have to come up with some kind of some rules. <laughs> How are we going to do this, right? 
And the men, when even when I asked them about it, you know, they usually would fall into explaining the alphabet and explaining um, particularly the airplanes, because it was very easy to explain that. It was much more difficult to explain some of the things that they did that were based more in the language and how the language worked. So what I want to do is I want to share with you a little section that I use, uh, excuse me, with my um, my lecture. Mm -hmm. So let me open up my thing here. Mm -hmm. uh, current slide. Okay. So if you think about the Navajo code in terms of um, techniques or methods, look at these things in the triangle as methods, right? So they substituted words. They did do that. They created an alphabet, yes. They also did other things. Um, and so three of them that I've started to look at and you can see the pattern of every time there were additions made to the code, they continued to use these same techniques. So the one that um, I've, I really, is fascinating to me, I call compounding. Um, and then new, they would make up new words, which was very typical of Navajo. Um, mm. And then plain text is just basically speaking Navajo. So mm. let me, um, let me back up here really quick. So usually when I do my presentation to mostly Biliganas, um, you know, I explain that Navajo, what it is, you know, it's a polysynthetic language, meaning that it's made up of morphemes, which are the sounds in a, in a word, right? So, and in Navajo and polysynthetic languages, these morphemes are these little tiny sounds, but they have individual meaning. So if you think of it as a train, Navajos will put these little words like beshlo, right? Like you just said, you know, beshlo. Mm -hmm. They put two sounds together and it makes a, a, a word. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then I give an example here of the ver verb nashid, or I am scratching you. And so mm -hmm. I break it down into those morphemes. So, you know, she, ne, be, I, mm -hmm. you, he, she. Mm -hmm. So ne is you, sh is she. I, and then the verb id, right? Mm -hmm. To scratch. So it breaks down into these morphemes and mm -hmm. the sentence structure, the verb always comes at the end in Navajo. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just ask people to keep that in mind. So then going into um, the code structure here, um, and these, these again, think of them as techniques. Mm -hmm. So substitution. Often you hear this, this explanation. They use airplanes. Um, even the code talkers themselves describe this all the time. Uh, what they did is they obviously didn't have words for dive bombers and transport planes and, and you know dive uh, fighter planes and all of those kinds of things. Yeah. So what they did is they looked at the birds, right, that they were familiar with, um, and they looked at the characteristics of that, that equipment, that airplane. What was that specific airplane doing? And then they would would match it up with a bird that did similar things. So, you know, a chicken hawk, a guinea, if you ever watched, a, you know, them hunt, right? <laughs> as soon mm -hmm. as they get their prey, whew, you know, they dive bomb, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, observation plane, um, you know, always watching, right? Owls are always yeah. watching. Uh uh, fighter planes, if you've ever watched hummingbirds, right? <laughs> you know, they're little quick things, you know, and when they're fighting with each other. Uh, so so that's how they did that. You know, it's a pretty easy way to see that. And so that's usually what you hear the most about. Okay. So that's one technique. Mm -hmm. They did the alphabet. Um, real quick, the original code talkers developed, uh, they used what uh, the military used at that time, which was the uh, International Phonetic Alphabet. So there's there's this um, alphabetical code that was used militarily by allies, right, in World War One, And uh, it was changed later after World War II. It's, it's um, still used to this day. You, you know, you hear Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, right? And what yeah. that is, is mm -hmm. the word starts with a letter that it's going to represent, right? A, B, mm -hmm. C, D, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta. So yeah. the, they use that same idea. So just um, three examples, the first three letters of the alphabet. They chose the word in English that started with that letter, but then in Navajo, they purposely chose words that didn't start with the same letter, right? Mm. Um, and the first 29 came up with one word for each letter of the alphabet. 
after they were sent overseas, uh, the cryptographers, American cryptographers, were concerned that there there was too um, there was a problem with this, or there could be a potential problem with this, with only one word for each letter. And that's because you know, thinking if you're a cryptographer and you're looking at a code and you know it's an alphabetical code. Um, languages have patterns, right? So in English, we have double consonants a lot of times, better, butter, little. Um, uh, con uh, the, the vowels uh, tend to fall in certain places in words. Words yeah. end in E-R, L-Y. So mm -hmm. cryptographers will look for those patterns. And if they start to hear two words together, uh, it must be a, 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 con a commonly used consonant. So oh, wow. they add the they add they asked the code talkers that came in later um, during one of the uh, sessions when they added new words to add more words for con commonly used consonants and for vowels. And so again, these are just examples of the first three letters of the alphabet. Okay. All wow. right. Cool. Now there's compounding. This one is really interesting. If you pull up the code, which you can look on online, you just put Navajo code and, and the Navajo code will come up. Look in the general vocabulary and you'll see these words that you're like, what? What did they do? So, and I think this goes back to the way Navajos think about these morphemes, right? They're used to breaking words down into these component parts. Mm -hmm. So you look at words like secure. Mm -hmm. You see the word cure inside that word? Mm -hmm. The word hill. You see the word ill or sick? Mm. So that's what they did. They saw those words. So they said, okay, well, let's use the alphabetical code and just Navajo. So what mm. they did is they took cure in Navajo, just plain text, the word. Mm. And then they took the two letters that were left over, E and S, right? Mm -hmm. So they took the, the word that they developed for S, sheep, the be. E was I, but not, and cure in plain Navajo is Nazi. So it became the bet, but not Nazi. She oh, by wow. cure was secure. Same thing for hill, ill or sick. Mm -hmm. And then the letter H. He was the word for horse. And mm -hmm. it's actually das, uh, there should be an extra S in there, das, uh, which is sick. So hill became sick horse. Oh, wow. See? So when you look now at the code, you'll see these words and, and you'll look at how, what the translation is and, and you'll go, oh, it'll say like BH deer or something. And then oh. break it down. Look at the, the alphabetical code and you'll figure out what they did. Wow. Uh, they also made up new words. You know, this is very typical of Navajos, right? We, we, we make up new words all the time. So like Navajo bus system has its own name now, you know, Navajo and in, in World War II, um, Hitler was, um, they used to call him the man that smells his mustache because he always used to, you know, make these oh, funny, yeah. funny faces. Um, yeah. So, you know, they made yeah. up words. So, for <laughs> example, in the code, um, Germany, they, they probably went to you know, movies while they were in, in, this, uh, in boot camp um, yeah. and they would see newsreels. And in those newsreels, they probably saw German soldiers and they had a very distinctive metal helmet. And yeah. so that's what that's what they picked up on. So they called them Besh um, or metal, metal hat. And to break uh, it down again into those morphemes, metal, besh, be uh, his or her a hat. And then it is at the end of the, the word. Um, it's not really a formal verb, but it's a uh, it's hard to explain, but anyway, it's yeah. supposed to be there. So besh bichai is what we still call the Germans today. And this is a word that they created for the code. Wow. So yeah, and this is a picture of what the actual one of the code books that they very, you know, politically incorrect. You see how they're talking to each other, right? These men just created an amazing code that helped win World War II and or was helping win World War II at the time and um, very sophisticated. And yet their cover for it was two Indian Marines, UG, better than TBY. The other one just answers UG, right? And if you look real close yeah. at the man's, uh, the one with his arms crossed on yeah. his hip, he's got a, he's got a canteen uh, and it says fire water. Fire on water. It. Holy cow. Yeah. <laughs> That's insane. Wow. So anyway, 
that's just a real quick um uh it looks like they're doing uh smoke signals too I like the um yeah <laughs> they have a rug with the you know, you know putting putting out smoke signals wow that's fascinating so so some of this um some some of this deciphering and analyzing of the code um what were you assisted by the by by certain code talkers to kind of you know help you um learn these things or is is this stuff that was kind of like basically having you know access to some of these uh, uh declassified materials and then kind of you know looking at the words and maybe working backwards i mean yeah um, well it's a little of both i mean the men i did try to get them to talk about it um and most code talkers will fall into the same thing because I think they just find it easier to explain it. Mm -hmm. I don't think they they may have, they may not have consciously said, okay, we're going to do this, mm -hmm. um, but they made that decision, and because you can see it readily in the first, because what I'm looking at is the first code, because mm -hmm. they laid the foundation, right? So the first code, for example, that compounding that I with the word hill and secure. Mm -hmm. The first 29, I think there are three words and they're small words. I, I don't even remember now exactly what they are, but they're small words mm -hmm. that they use that technique. And they only had three words out of 200. But there were three major additions that were made to the code after the first 29 and before the end of the war. If you look and you chart those, and I've done this great big, you know, <laughs> uh, Excel sheet, <laughs> when you chart it, you see that later code talkers, and we don't even know who those later code talkers were, whoever mm -hmm. worked on developing these new terms picked up on these techniques. So somebody picked up on that technique because you'll see, like in the general vocabulary, there's there's dozens of words that use use that particular technique. Ooh. I never heard code talkers talk about it, but when mm -hmm. you start looking at the code, you start seeing these similarities, you start seeing these patterns. And so that's wow. what I'm trying to identify now. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. That's really insightful. Uh, I thank you for sharing that. I think that, uh, yeah. you know, that's, that's, that's really magnificent in terms of being able to uh, just present some insight. And, and I like how you, um, you prefaced it in terms of how, you know, often, our languages are looked upon as as uh, primitive uh, by by outsiders, and um, but also you know contrasting that with how people who are trying to decipher a code would analyze maybe what they're hearing in terms of of like you were saying double consonants, double vowels, and then how our our people went went ahead and and switched up uh certain um certain um words for for letters you know to kind of to kind of throw them off i think that's super smart i think that's something that uh people don't realize um at the time was was what helped us you know win that war and yeah. uh, and our people were the ones who who kind of uh, who were able to do that you know and you know i think a lot of you know a lot of tribes you know, there were other code talkers and a lot of other tribes. We have to give credit to their languages as well, too. Um, but for us and to be for our our language to have been used successfully in these ways, it's um, it's uh, pertinent and it's uh, relevant. And it's, you know, we, for us to look at it and say, this is this is how we did it is awesome. You know, I, I like that insight. Um, are you able to maybe just uh, we're, we're we're coming up on the top of the hour, but maybe tell us about some of um, some of the things you're doing currently um, in terms of your research. <laughs> well, I like I said, I went back to grad school, um, <laughs> which uh, has turned into a massive uh, production that I wasn't expecting it to take so long. Uh, so I got through my master's. Um, I, I had a little bout with cancer as I started my PhD program. So I had to take a year off. Um, I'm cancer free now. Uh, they monitor me every six months to a year. So, so well, all happy to hear. Knock on wood. 
Um, but I, it, you know, it slowed me down. Um, and so now, now I'm at my dissertation stage. <laughs> so right now that's like literally my entire life, uh, 24 seven. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done a lot of the research, obviously. Um, so trying to pull some of this together, you know, into a cohesive, I'm, I'm writing original about the original group. Um, so that's my dissertation. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I continued, I work, you know, I work with descendants on, in different ways, uh, I, I often have a lot of descendants that will come to me and say, especially grandkids, um, you know, they'll say, you know, my grandpa was a code talker and the family doesn't have any photographs of him, you know, uh, for whatever reason, the house burned down or, you know, great grandma burned all of the stuff or, you mm -hmm. know, for whatever reason, they don't have anything. And so they ask me, can you find a picture of my grandpa? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that's not always easy. Uh, fortunately the Marine Corps, when, when you went into the Marine Corps, they would take your picture and they, they look mm -hmm. like mug shots because <laughs> they have <laughs> a chart behind them, you know, how tall they were. Mm -hmm. And they literally would do it. I think just to see, you know, they would do it right after they gave them their buzz cut. <laughs> mm -hmm. So these guys are standing there, you know, kind of like deer in the headlights, you know, what have I gotten myself into snap? Um, mm -hmm. But sometimes that's the only photograph that, you know, I, I can find. Oh, wow. um, I've also just recently, you know, started uh, my my real love is the research. I love the research. I love the archives. I love discovering things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now for many, many years, there's been talk of a museum. There's mm -hmm. been talk of, um, you know, trying to preserve the history. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Smith started the Navajo Code Talker Day, which is an amazing event that happens every year in Windorock. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that event has kind of become uh, a, memor a memorialization, right? Um, because mm -hmm. families that who's lost lost their code talkers, they've they've started to put up tents and mm -hmm. booths to display things. Mm -hmm. And when the event started, it was one or two, you know, card tables. The family obviously just brought photographs. They probably took off their wall. And now there's these these very elaborate booths that they put up. Um, and so families have been trying to get into, you know, preserving these things. So mm. with this in mind, you know, hopefully moving toward a museum, whether it happens this time around or not, it, it's been talked for, for many years. Mm -hmm. um, but the families themselves have these things, they want to help preserve them, and I want to help them to preserve them. Mm. So I've started these workshops, we've done two so far. Uh, and it's basically just a, a workshop to help families um, you know, identify what they have, you know, what kinds of things are important. Some people just think about photographs, but what about, you know, did your code talker go to meetings? Did he keep all the agendas? <laughs> um, did he write notes at the, at the meetings? Uh, things like that. You know, did he go to events? Did he keep the brochures? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, talking about what, what kinds of material and then how to, how to preserve it. Mm -hmm. So we've done two. They've they've been really successful. Uh, we're looking at doing other kinds of things, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of people have been asking me to do them like this, you know, live stream them and things like that. I'm not tech savvy, so I got to get somebody that can help me put that together. But hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, we'll continue doing some some things like that. Awesome, awesome. Well, um, I want to thank you again, Kehe. Appreciate you coming on. Uh, uh, you're just in Gallup. You're just an arm's reach away. We're going to have to go have uh, dinner sometime or lunch yes, or, you know, come sure. come by and see me and my mom. We we always love to see you. Uh, but uh, appreciate your sharing your expertise here. I learned a lot. And I think that it's something that our viewers um, who have tuned in and who will tune in uh, will definitely learn from. So uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I want to also, again, shout out all of our veterans, uh, Native veterans and non-Native veterans for their service today um, on Veterans Day. Uh, it's important. It's important for us to recognize our relatives who have uh, sacrificed. Sometimes, like uh, Zani had mentioned, some of our relatives come back and have um, PTSD. Uh, you know, they come back different than when they had left. But... Um, we, we need to honor them in, in what they have done. Um, some people, uh, like, like we learned today, 
enlisted in one branch, but ended up in another branch, you know, but those were the, those were the, uh, those were the times that our, our relatives lived in. And uh, we, we can't change those things. But as descendants of veterans and people who have went to war, you know, uh, I think that we need to appreciate them and, and just reach out to them. So reach out and check up on your veteran relatives today. So uh, make them some coffee, take them something to eat, always keep them in mind, especially during the holidays. So uh, thank you, Auntie Zani. And uh, we'll talk again soon, okay? All right. Good to see you, Mahal. We'll see you. Pagoan, man. Oh.